So this is one of the biggest fuck you moments in history. During the Salem witch trials of 1692, a man named Giles Corey was arrested and accused of witchcraft. Of course, he denied these accusations and refused to plead either innocent or guilty. So the law at the time stated that anyone who refused to plead couldn't be tried in court. So to avoid people trying to avoid justice, in order to obtain a plea, people would be stripped naked, placed with a heavy board of wood on top of them, and then a bunch of stones on top of them. So people would eventually plead due to all the pain and suffering they're going through. But our mad lad today, Giles Corey, still refused to plead innocent or guilty. And every time the sheriff asked him for a plea, Giles instead responded more weight. Corey eventually died from the weight, but he managed to endure this painful form of death in silence. Because he refused to plead, he died in full possession of his estates, which otherwise would have been forfeited to the government had he entered a plea. So his two son-in-laws inherited them. Absolute legend. So the execution of William Wallace was quite a savage affair, and while he didn't scream out freedom as popularised by Mel Gibson, he did defy King Edward I until his end. After his defeat at the Battle of Falkirk in 1298, Wallace went backpacking around Europe in order to find himself, and by the time he was back in Scotland in 1304, all the Scottish lords had or were about to submit to Edward after he had beaten them into submission in the years prior. On Wallace's return to Scotland, he continued his rebellion to the annoyance of almost all Scottish lords who wanted rid of him to symbolise the end of the old Scottish resistance in this instance and the start of a new alliance between England and Scotland. Wallace evaded capture until the 3rd of August 1305, likely trying to fight on to meet his end with a sword in his hand. However, this was not to happen as he was captured around Glasgow by a Scottish noble. Why Wallace was in Glasgow at this point is unknown, with one theory suggesting he was trying to take a boat away from Scotland to escape the English man hunt, but he wasn't betrayed as the Scottish noble who captured him was loyal to Edward and saw Wallace as an enemy and an honour to capture him. Wallace was taken to London where he stood trial on the 23rd of August and he was met with a crowd of boos with a mock crown being placed on his head to humiliate him, showing he was king of all the outlaws. Wallace was charged with unalivings, arson, destruction of property and sacrilege, sparing neither young or old, none of which he could deny. What he did deny though was his treason charge against Edward, stating the famous line, I could not be a traitor to Edward, for I was never his subject, which is technically true, for when the Scottish Lords swore allegiance to Edward in 1296 and again in 1304, Wallace was never present. But to Edward, all the Scottish were his subjects after the Kingdom of Scotland was surrendered by John Balliol in 1296, whether they had sworn loyalty or not. But it didn't really matter though, Wallace wasn't getting out of this one alive. He was sentenced to be barbarously done to death, where he was to be hung, drawn and quartered, so a bit of viewer discretion advice from here on out. He was unclothed and dragged through the streets of London by horses, before he was hung until he was almost gone, and then he was cut down. His gentleman area was then cut off to symbolise he could father no more traitors, although he couldn't in a few minutes as he was cut open, insides torn out and then burnt in front of him. He was then beheaded and torn into four parts where his head was put atop of London Bridge and his limbs were sent to Newcastle, Stirling, Perth and Berwick to deter future rebellions and Edward had finally got rid of his long-standing foe. Although it didn't really deter the Scots as the next year saw Robert the Bruce's rebellion start. So one of the most fascinating executions in history has to be that of Alice Tankerville, who in 1534 was put to death in a sensational love story, and she is also remarkably the only ever woman to escape from the Tower of London. The story begins in 1531 when a shipment of 366 gold crowns, worth well over £900,000 a day, was to arrive in London from Germany, however when the chest was opened, the gold was nowhere to be seen. An investigation was launched and for the next two years, very little evidence showed up. But what did pointed to one man named John Wolfe, a known thief and pirate who had been part of the ship's crew while it was anchored in London. John was banged up in the tower in 1533, but luckily for him his lovely wife Alice Tankerville, who was also a known pirate, thief and murderer, bought him clothes and gifts while he was imprisoned. It was here that Alice met and befriended tower guard John Board, who allowed her to sneak in more extravagant gifts for her husband, and would also be crucial to her future escape, although she wasn't in prison just yet. After six months of being locked up, John was finally released on lack of evidence, but he fled to Ireland straight away, which was extremely us for the crown, and after only a few weeks after his release, new evidence arose, pointing to John and an accomplice, Alice Tankerville. 
John and Alice return to England in the next year where they robbed and murdered two wealthy Italian merchants along the River Thames and now they were both banged up in the Tower of London. Alice was shackled to the walls in an extremely secure cell with a heavy oak door so there was no chance for her escape which was an unusually severe punishment for someone at the time but one prosecutor wrote about her if the diabolical woman escape we shall be in great jeopardy and there was no remedy for her but her death it was here now that alice's friendship with tower guard john board came into play with some reports suggesting their relationship had turned into a loving one and his visits were the highlight of her day amongst the people screaming of being tortured around the tower their love though is what got both of them killed as apparently Alice and John had agreed to start a new life together should they escape and one night John did try and help Alice escape as he tied a rope down the tower into the moat to get a boat across the moat. They crossed the moat and made towards some horses which were ready to finalise their escape from London. However, just before reaching them, a group of night watchmen appeared. Alice hugged John in a lover's embrace in an attempt to hide her identity, but the watchmen recognised their colleague John and soon Alice, and the game was up, and Alice was once again banged up in the Tower of London, and John was banged up in the Tower of London for the first time. Tower guard John Board suffered a horrific torture at the hands of the rack before being hung from his arms from the tower walls where he passed from the exposure to the elements. Alice along with her husband John Wolfe were hung in chains when the Thames was at a low watermark and slowly and probably extremely horrifically the murky waters of the Thames rose drowning them both. What actually happened to the money that was stolen is unknown, but the execution of Alice and two Johns is quite a fascinating one. So this lovely lady here is Margaret Pohl, and in 1541 she suffered a horrific execution under the reign of King Henry VIII. She was the Countess of Salisbury and one of the few surviving members of the House Plantagenet during the end of the Wars of the Roses, and during the start of Henry's reign she was a lady in favour. However, after Henry's separation from the Catholic Church and his first wife Catherine of Aragon, tensions between Margaret's family and Henry began to rise. In 1538, a conspiracy to overthrow Henry VIII and replace him with his cousin, called the Exeter Conspiracy, was foiled and she and her two sons were arrested on suspicion of treason and banged up in the Tower of London. Some sources suggest though that the conspiracy was actually largely exaggerated by this man here, Thomas Cromwell, Henry's first minister, in an attempt to take their lands away in the south and crush any threat of a potential rebellion. Their cause at this point though seems a lot more religious based than political based as Margaret and her family were heavily Catholic. She was kept in the Tower of London in a lovely room under the weight of her servants for two and a half years before on the morning of the 27th of May 1541 she was told she would be dying within the hour. Margaret was adamant that she had committed no crime but nonetheless was still sentenced to execution by beheading. Now there are a few eyewitness accounts of this execution, with one stating that the main executioner was in the north dealing with the rebels, so a wretched and blundering youth was to perform the execution. Apparently the inexperienced axeman struck the back of her head on the first go, missing her neck completely, and it took a further 10 blows to separate the head from the body, making a bloody mess of her torso. Another account, which is kind of dubious written about a century later, stated that Margaret actually refused to lay her head on the chopping block as she was no traitor, and told the executioner if he wanted her head, he had to get it any way he could, so he made a savage mess of her body. 